Hello and welcome to this next tutorial here in this section on artificial neural networks. Although again, just like in the last tutorial on activation functions, this is just as applicable for the convolutional neural networks that we will learn about, build and apply later on. So far, we have covered off the general structure of an artificial neural network. We've looked at the weights and biases and how they are used, and we've looked at the importance of activation functions. The next big step that a neural network takes is this process called back propagation, where we essentially head back through the network from right to left. And through the clever use of something called the chain rule, as well as gradient descent, the network iteratively makes small alterations to the weights and biases before moving on to the next observation or set of observations and running this process over again. We can see in the orange box to the bottom of the screen that back propagation is labeled as step five in our overall process. But there is something we need to do prior to this. And what I'm talking about is step four, where we calculate the loss. And loss, if defined nice and simply, is just a quantified view of how much of a mismatch there is between the predicted output or outputs and the actual output or outputs. Remember that when we are training a neural network, we are indeed using data where we know the actual outputs as well. And understanding this mismatch between the predictions and these actual values is the only way the network can understand how to better map the relationship between inputs and outputs. So this loss calculation is super important. Now, you can calculate loss in any way that you want. For complex problems, you may come up with some specific loss function that suits your needs. But 99% of the time, you'll be using some pretty standard methods. So let's talk about these. And similar to what we discussed in the section on activation functions, it can really depend on the type of problem you're looking to solve, which most of the time will either be regression, binary classification, or multi-class classification. For a standard regression problem, we would take the output values from our single output neuron and these values would be our network's prediction. We would then compare the prediction or predictions to the actual values. In terms of how many observations we use for this comparison, like we discussed at the end of the introductory tutorial, there are some different options. We can do this one data point at a time and then look to go back and update the weights. We can do this on a mini batch, or in other words, a subset of the training data and then look to update the weights. Or we can do it for all of our training data and then look to update our weights. For illustration purposes here, let's just think of a small training data set of five data points, each of which would flow through the network one at a time and a prediction would be made. For these five data points, we would have both the predicted output values from the network and the actual output values from our data, and I've shown those here. For a regression problem, the most commonly used loss function is known as mean squared error, or MSE for short. And this is a very simple metric. We just calculate the error between our predicted outputs and the actual outputs. So simply the predicted value minus the actual value. And then we square those error values to ensure that everything is positive. And then we take the mean or the average of those squared errors to give us the mean squared error for those particular predictions. And this is our loss, which here we can see has a value of 2.59. And now we have this loss value, our network can carry out back propagation and try to optimize the values for the weights and biases in a way that reduces that loss. In other words, in a way that makes our predictions less wrong. So let's say it has done just that. We would hopefully find that our predictions would be slightly closer to the actual values. And thus we would see lower errors and a lower mean squared error or loss score, meaning that our network is learning. So for regression problems, we often use mean squared error like we've seen here. But what about classification problems? How do we calculate loss for those? Well, we often use something called cross entropy. And for binary classification problems, we use binary cross entropy. And for multi-class classification problems, we use categorical cross entropy. And under the hood, they are basically the same thing, but just with a very subtle twist. Both of the cross entropy calculations have quite complex looking formulas, but I promise they are actually super easy to understand once you know how. 
So let's take a look starting with binary cross entropy. And once you know that, categorical cross entropy is a walk in the park. So to set this up, let's revisit our cat versus dog problem, which again, like I mentioned last time, would actually be solved using a convolutional neural network rather than artificial neural network like we see here. But for illustration's sake, it works well as an example. And you might remember that in that last tutorial on activation functions, we took the value of the output neuron and then we used the sigmoid activation function to squish this into a single probability value that existed somewhere between 0 and 1. Here we can see that for the image of the cat on the left of screen that our network was reasonably confident giving it a predicted probability of being a cat of 0.8 or 80%. So just like we did in our regression example, let's discuss how we would calculate loss in this particular scenario. And to do this, let's start by just focusing on just this one image of a cat and the network's prediction that is on screen here. Cool, so again, in our example here, we can see that our network is providing us a a predicted probability of 0.8 or 80% for that image on the left being a cat. So let's put that into a table so we can keep track of everything we need for this binary cross entropy calculation. Right, so as we discussed earlier, as this is a binary classification scenario, saying there is an 80% probability of the data point belonging to class 1 means we can also say there is a 1 minus 0.8 probability of the data point belonging to class 2. So we can put 0.2 into our table there for our dog prediction. Now for those other two numbers that we need down in the bottom of our table there, the process is actually really simple. Since this is training data, remember we know the actual labels and we know this image is of a cat. So we can put in a one for cat and a zero for dog. And these are essentially our known probabilities for this image. We know it is a cat. So we can say that it has a 100% probability of actually being a cat. Now, to calculate the loss using binary cross entropy as the loss function, we need to use this formula here, which, like I said at first glance, can seem a bit scary, but it really isn't. Firstly, x in this equation is essentially just referring to our particular image or data point in question, and p and q are just two probability distributions, which again sounds scary, but it's just our actual probabilities for class 1 and class 2, which are 1 and 0, those bottom two numbers in our table, and this is what p refers to, and then q is referring to our predicted probabilities for class 1 and 2, so 0 0.8 and 0 0.2, which you can see at the top of our table. Now, with all of that in mind, let's rewrite this formula in words, which will make it a whole lot easier to understand. So our loss is equal to the negative sum of our class 1 actual probability. So this here is the actual probability that this image is of a cat, which is 1, multiplied by the natural log, which is symbolized in the formula by the letters ln, of our class 1 predicted probability, which here is 0 0.8, plus our class 2 actual probability, so this here is the actual probability that this image is of a dog, which is 0, and you can see in the formula at the top, this is just being denoted by 1 minus our actual probability of class 1, multiplied by the natural log of our class 2 predicted probability, which here is 0 0.2. And again, in the formula, you can see this is being denoted by 1 minus our class 1 predicted probability, or 1 minus 0 0.8, which we've just calculated earlier for our table. And that there is everything that we need. This formula will give us our binary cross entropy loss value for this particular prediction. So let's now go ahead and do the calculations. Let's plug all of these values in. So 1, our class 1 actual probability, multiplied by the natural log of 0 0.8, our class 1 predicted probability, plus 0, our class 2 actual probability, multiplied by the natural log of 0 0.2, our class 2 predicted probability. And I can tell you that all of that equals 0 0.2231. Now, at this point, I am sure you still have a lot of questions. You'll have no doubt been able to follow along, but you are probably asking why. 
why do we use this formula? And maybe more specifically, why do we use the negative sum of all of this? And why do we use the natural log? And you might even be asking, is 0.2231 a good loss value or a bad loss value? And these are all extremely good questions. So let's discuss them now. The reason we use the natural log of our predicted probabilities is really so that we get a high loss value when our predictions are bad and a low loss value when our predictions are good. To visualize what I'm saying here, if we were to plot the natural log of all probability values between 0.01 and 0.99, we would get this here. And you can see that for our image of the cat, where our model predicted a probability of 80%, we would end up at this point here, giving us a loss value of negative 0.2231. Now, like I mentioned before, what we really want in order to assess our prediction error is a low positive number for good or I guess accurate predictions and a high positive number for bad or inaccurate predictions. And this is the reason we take the negative value of everything we calculate. And you can see I've highlighted where that happens in red here. So instead of negative 0.2231, we end up with a loss for this particular image prediction of positive 0.2231. Now the next question after all of this would naturally be, is this a good loss score? Well, I guess it's all relative, but remember that a neural network is inherently an optimization tool where we're trying to get the lowest possible loss. So any loss value near zero is good. It says that our network's predictions are well matched with what is actually true. Or in other words, the difference between our predictions and our actuals is very low. Now to hopefully make this all sink in a little bit more, let's say that our model wasn't that good. And when we fed in the image of the cat at the top of screen, it didn't give a probability prediction for cat of 80%. It instead only gave a probability prediction of 50%. In other words, it really isn't sure if it's a cat or a dog. So let's change the numbers from 0.8 and 0.2 at the top of this table to instead be 0.5 and 0.5. You can see that when we run those updated numbers through our formula, instead of a loss value of around 0.22, we're now up at 0.69. The prediction of the model was worse when compared to the actual, or in other words, there was a larger mismatch between the prediction and the actual. And this is being reflected with a higher loss value. All right, so that is the basics of binary cross entropy. And to be honest, you don't really need to know the formula for this off by heart, but it is very good to have some idea of how it works under the hood. It means that when building and assessing neural networks in your career, not only will you have an understanding of what this means when you see it, it will help you build better networks, understand how to optimize them, and also assess when something might not be working as it should. Now, what we've done here, is we've just calculated the binary cross entropy loss for the prediction of one data point, or in this case, one image. In reality, your network will often wait until it has seen a batch of inputs before it updates the weights and biases. And in this case, we would just take the average of all of the loss scores in the batch. So here we have our cat image at the top that was predicted with a probability of 0.8 to be a cat and with a loss of 0.22. We have a second image of a dog in the middle there and the network was pretty confident about that too, saying there was a probability of only 0.14 or 14% of that being a cat. Or in other words, because there are only two possible outcomes, there is an 86% chance that it was a dog. And this has an even lower loss score of 0.15 as it was even more confident of the correct class than our first image. And then image three at the bottom there is actually a cat, although you can forgive the model for getting confused. It predicted a probability of only 0.27 that this was a cat. So it actually thought this image was more likely to be a dog. And because of this error, we can see we are being penalized with a higher cross entropy score of 1.31. And since we're saying here that the network was going to wait until this batch of three images had passed through before updating its weights, we simply take the average of all three to get a batch cross entropy loss score of 0 
And of course, the network would then go about its business trying to alter the weights and bias values using backpropagation and gradient descent in a way that reduces this as far as possible. Cool, so that is binary cross entropy. What about categorical cross entropy for cases where we are dealing with a multi-class classification problem? In the example you can see on screen, it's just one more class. So our model is trying to understand whether each image is of a cat, a dog, or a cow. So the same example we discussed in the last tutorial on activation functions. And you might remember from that last tutorial that instead of a sigmoid activation function on the output layer, we used the softmax function to convert our outputs to probabilities across all classes that added up to a total of one or a total of 100%. And here within that red box, we can see that our network was pretty confident that the image was of a cat, giving a predicted probability of 0.89 or 89%, compared to 0.10 or 10% for dog and only 0.01 0.01 or 1% for cow. But how would we use these values when calculating loss? With binary cross entropy, we only had two possible outcomes, cat or essentially not cat. And now we have three. Well, you'd be glad to know that it actually works in almost the same way. With our binary example, we had this here, with our table helping us illustrate the formula. When we have more than two classes, this formula really just extends to take in the extra ones. So instead of simply being the negative sum of class one actual probability multiplied by the natural log of the class one predicted probability, plus the class two actual probability multiplied by the natural log of the class two predicted probability, now we just also do plus the class three actual probability multiplied by the natural log of the class three predicted probability. And we would continue to add these for every extra class that we had. Here, the updated predictions and actuals are in the table on the left. And the formula at the bottom of screen is showing the actual calculation containing all of that information. And all of this gives us a categorical cross entropy loss score for this particular image prediction of 0.117. And of course, in the same way we discussed earlier, this is just for one image. But if the network was gonna take a batch of images prior to updating the weights and biases, then again, we would just take the average of all of them. And here we see we get an average categorical cross entropy loss score of 0.40 across a batch of three images. And also, just like we talked about with our earlier binary cross entropy example, the network would then go about its business trying to alter the weights and bias values through back propagation in a way that reduces this loss score as far as possible. So as a bit of a recap and a guide that you can take away, we would often use, but are not limited to, mean squared error for regression problems, binary cross entropy for binary classification problems, and we most often would use categorical cross entropy for multi-class classification. I've again included multi-label classification here, and in this case, as we would use the sigmoid activation function on each output neuron, we would use binary cross entropy for each class separately. And then we would add all of those up to get our complete loss. A little bit more work to be done there, but the same process under the hood. All right, so there we go. Give yourself another pat on the back. You are doing so unbelievably well taking all of this in. I know it is a lot, but you are definitely getting there. Once we start coding this up and applying neural networks, this will all come together even more. And of course, you can always revisit these tutorials as a refresher. So don't worry too much if everything isn't crystal clear at this point. This is complex stuff and it will stick eventually. It really does take time practice and application. Next, we are going to get onto how the network optimizes the weights and biases to minimize this loss. A very exciting and extremely important topic. So I will see you for more neural network fun in the next tutorial.